Welcome to the Global Discussion, discussions with creatives, leaders and thinkers. My name is Simon Hodgkins and today I'm delighted to be joined by Mary Rose Lyons of the AI Institute. You're very welcome to the show, Mary Rose. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, let's begin. Uh, let me ask you to introduce yourself. Tell us all about the work that you're involved in and maybe a little bit as well about the AI Institute. So over to you, Mary Rose. Great. Thank you very much. I am a future focused marketer and I have built my business of old, which is called Bright Spark, which I've had for 20 years. I've built that business around using tools. Um, in fact, when I was celebrating 18 years in business, I created an ebook of 42 tools you need to use to grow your business. So I've always been tools girl and I've always been very good at kind of guessing what trends are going to stick. So you can imagine my excitement around the 30th of November 2022 when ChatGPT launched and I was just so excited. I was so bowled over. I was actually delivering a training on the 1st of December and um, it was to a group of hoteliers and I was literally going, wait, till you see this thing? And that was the start of, of my demos. So I suppose I'm on a mission really to to help um, other people. It started out as other marketers uh, to use ChatGPT and AI to augment the way they do their work, because if you don't, you're going to get left behind. And if you do, you're going to have just a lot more time to spend on other things. You can be more productive and the quality of your, what you can produce can be better. Well, thanks for sharing that. And I, I look, I know you've been involved in this digital marketing tools world. And I suppose in today's parlance, we we talk a lot about maybe the marketing tech stack and all the tools that we use in marketing. Um, and it's changed fundamentally, hasn't it? As you say, this big juggernaut has came by called <laughs> artificial intelligence or generative AI and chat GPT and many others are available now. But you also touched on an important point, which I want to maybe ask you a little bit more about, which is getting it to improve efficiencies, getting it to, to help you to be more effective. Um, and people are spending a lot of time maybe testing and trialing, but you must be able to identify where people can maybe really benefit from the world of AI, as opposed to just spend so much time analyzing all the tools, all the news, and all the noise that's generated by AI at the moment. Is that right, Mary Rose? Absolutely. And there was, there's been quite a lot of noise in recent times with the um, the corporate uh, kerfuffle going on over in, in OpenAI, which I am not going to talk about because, as I said, when that all happened and when it broke, I'm a marketer. Um, I'm not a corporate financier. I'm not a VC investor. I just use the tools. So, yeah, there is a lot of noise. We're living in a hype cycle. Um, I spent the start of this year, I say I spent the first three months of this year in a state of utter paranoia that there's so many tools. How am I going to test them? How am I going to work them? You know, I just was breaking out in hives um, at, at what's out there. But then I worked out a kind of a curated set that worked for me as a marketer. Um, then I worked out kind of curated ways to work them. I use some for some things, others for other things. And then I put all of this into my first course, um, which was literally, I kind of tentatively brought it to market going, this is AI for marketers. And I kind of thought like, well, other marketers want to learn from me. And it just sold out instantly. And I went, okay, cool. I'll, I'll do it again next month. So obviously the entire slide deck changed because in a month, you know, a lot of things happen. And uh, then the next one sold out instantly and so on and so on. And that has been this year. And I've even got to the stage starting from around September and October where people who did the course at the start, they're coming back and they want refreshers. It's, it's, that, it's that engaged, it's that exciting, it's that fast changing. And I'm kind of positioning myself with my new business, which is called the AI Institute. I've got together with some other course creators who are not just marketers, uh, we can talk about them in a moment, but I basically brought some people together and we're offering courses for people who need and who know and recognize that they want to get in on this, but they don't know where to start. And I promise you there's from the, the very beginning chat GPT AI for beginners right through to courses aimed at uh, IT departments who are tasked by their CTO to bring AI. 
Yeah, and I really do like the the fact that you're almost creating this hub, if I can use that term, of yeah. experts and courses and helpful guides and information around this AI Institute. And as you say, from people that are maybe still trying to understand what's going on here, grasping the basics, starting to use the tools and getting that wow moment that we've all experienced, um, right through to the IT director who's maybe been said, like, how are we implementing AI? How is it helping our business go faster, scale more, improve efficiencies? And there's an awful lot of requirements there. One mm -hmm. of the questions, though, is, do you touch on anything around AI ethics, the data privacy? Because that is a question that comes up a lot when I'm talking to maybe other business owners. Yes, it's a very good question. I'm really glad you asked it because we, we need to think about this. And I think I'm really glad that I suppose I'm quite an optimistic person. But I think one of the optimistic viewpoints I would have is that one of the learnings that we're taking as humans from the whole Web 2.0 social media time that we've just come through is that we're not going to let our data just be ripped from us. We are coming into this AI world with our eyes wide open and people are asking these questions. And it's not just you being a very informed person, Simon. So I'm I'm really glad of that, that that's the case. So in terms of, say, what we do at the AI Institute, we do everything from in the first module of every single course when we're showing people how to set up uh, ChatGPT and set up their custom instructions, one of the little things that I do is I get everyone to write into their custom instructions, always show me diverse perspectives in your answer. And this way, you are basically acknowledging the fact that the large language models, LLMs, things like Claude, GPT, Bing, they're not trained on a diverse world. You know, they're a little bit, you know, stale, male and pale, if you don't mind me saying. And um, they, it's basically a way of, of acknowledging that and asking them to bring us something more. So from that very basic level, right through to the fact that we have um, the uh, one of the guys who was the global, he wrote the global standard for AI ethics that's being used globally. He's delivering our AI ethics course. And it's going to be so much fun. It's not going to be a waffly kind of, you know, academic, all about ethics. It's actually going to be, because I'm pushing for it, I want to keep myself interested throughout. It's going to be conceptual. It's going to be thought experiments. It's going to be application to real world. And it's going to be homework. So it's going to be a fun ethics course, I promise. That's, that's great to hear. And it's such an important topic that does come up a lot. Mm. Um, and I, it's so encouraging to hear that because people are, are grappling not just with AI and the tools, but with the the other sort of areas of it. And you're right. Uh, you bring up that the LLMs are only trained on a certain type of data, and some of that has been scraped from the internet, and others has had data forced into them. And people are now building their own LLMs with their own data. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and as you say, the... I think maybe that the, the businesses and the business owners and the large corporates have suddenly realized that they're sitting on all this great data and how do they AI enable that data? Uh, of course, respecting things like data privacy and ethics, it's, it's a really important topic. So very encouraging to hear that. But the other question I've got for you, if I can, Mary Rose, is with this sort of what I've referred to in, in other conversations is this fire hose of AI news that's coming at us. <laughs> the next shiny tool. Oh, now it does this. Now it does that. Look at this upgrade. Look over here. How are you? Shiny keeping... new object syndrome. Yeah. How are you keeping on top of this? How are you onboarding information? Do you have to dedicate a certain amount of time to learn, to read, to understand? Is it is it podcasts? Is it social media? How are you plugged into the ecosystem? How do you stay on top as somebody sort of chairing this AI Institute? It's, uh, can I just tell you something? I'm not going to lie to you. Like I'm always on i'm always on i take my information through podcasts i go out walking i'm listening to podcasts i come home and i scribble down notes um i get the daily newsletters which i'm sure everyone gets you know the neuron ben's bites and so on um i'm on um i'm involved in kind of like deep user groups of very fierce technical people um where i'm like i'm just a marketer can i ask this question um i'm learning everywhere i'm learning everywhere but i think the most important thing is that i'm actually learning by doing so all the time I see something and I go, OK, how will that work? What's the user case for that? So um, and then what I do is I get a lot of kind of user testing done by my course uh, attendees. So, for example, um, 
there's a lot of talk at the moment about the text to video tools that are out there and runway is the kind of the darling of that kind of uh mouthpiece like it's getting a lot of column inches and not once not twice but i think about three times now i've had my course attendees uh take runway for a demo at home so in other words i'll give people maybe one or two uh, text to video tools and I'll say right split the group you're going to do runway you're going to do another one like capsule for example which I love give them specific tasks and then they use it and then we come back together the next week and it's like how did runway go how did capsule go and every time people are like runway it's kind of hard to learn it's kind of slow don't really like the results the outputs etc and that's every time not just me whereas capsule is much more admired and loved and people can see a need for it so Capsule doesn't have such a PR budget as Runway, but my kind of secret sauce is that I've done all this kind of testing. So when people come to my course for the, for the tools, it's like these are the ones that work for you, not necessarily the kind of the, the top 10 shiny object list that gets passed around. That's very interesting. So it, you're almost road testing these applications in real time and being able to offer that advice and expertise to uh, people that come to you for this type of information that's a great approach of course and um, in in terms of the other element of that then so you mentioned a few areas that you that you watch and listen to and that you plugged into is there any is there any area in particular that inspires you the most is there anybody in this space that you admire that you think's great uh, and also what do you think is some of the biggest advantages for people today that are entering and using AI to help them, whether it's in the personal brand or a business perspective? Yeah, well, I'll answer that first by sharing some of the resources that I love the most. I I follow and read and consume so much. Um, but I would say off the top of my head, my favorite YouTubers would be um, Kier, our very own from Ireland, Kieran Flanagan and Kip Bodnar. They have a really cool podcast, which I consume on, on YouTube called Marketing Against the Grain. So Kieran is the CMO of Zapier and Kip is the CMO of HubSpot and their buddies and their friends. But they're really good and they have really good guests on. So there would be one. I love Megan Keeney Anderson, who's the CMO of Jasper, which is a um, it's a kind of a it's like a tools based, it's a kind of a teams based approach to using ChatGPT. I love her. She shares loads of cool stuff. And um, I actually got to meet her at Sastock this year. Um, I was I was quite fangirl about that. Um, who else do I love? Um, Trust Insights. Very, when I first started getting into AI back in 2017, I was at the Social Media Marketing World Conference in San Diego. And there I met um, the team from Trust Insights. And um, I was just mesmerized by what they had to say. So they share really good content by newsletter. So they'd be like kind of a LinkedIn person, a YouTube and a newsletter. Um, so I hope that answers the first part of the question. Um, so what you were saying was like how people can use AI tools to to get on, is it, Jim? Yeah, so like in business or in from a, if somebody that wants to create maybe more of a personal brand or to get more awareness, or if yeah. they're running a small, medium or even a large business or maybe in charge of a division in a corporate type environment. How are you how are you seeing people uh, leverage AI? You know, is there any advice that you have for people there or any inspiring examples of where you can say, look, this is really working. This is what you should be doing here. So as I as I hear you rightly, so we want tips for small, medium and large and we want personal brand and tech and and all the stuff. So that's pretty much I don't want to sound like a salesperson. That's like all our courses pretty much. And um, what comes to mind is there's a group I'm I'm doing something with at, at the moment um, and it's the um, AI for self-employed freelancers course. OK, so I put this together. It's a four weeker. And um, so it's two hours a week over four weeks. Um, it runs in the evenings from six to eight. And the first lot was in November. So I called it the sure. What else would you be doing on a Tuesday night in November crew? And they are loving it. So it's a really mixed, broad bunch of people from uh, project managers to accountants to um, essential oils people like all the people. And what we do is we kind of take the I take them through, you know, you know, prompt structures. And um, part of that is actually, you know, 
knowing where your information has been trained by the model um, knowing where to turn it off. So, for example, um, if you ever want to do what I do all the time, which is uh, take a list of emails and make them a comma separated list of emails, marketers, you know, you've got to do that. And you see, no, you no longer have to do that by hand. You can just like copy and paste it, but you have to turn off the tracking in GPT so that those emails won't go out into the training model because then you'd be in breach of GDPR. So it's all this kind of stuff. So we do a lot of that kind of safety and security piece first. But um, then we go into things like um, using AI to help you get jobs. So whether it's something like um, uploading your CV onto ChatGPT and matching it against a job you're going to apply for and then instructing ChatGPT to go through each part of your CV and suggest ways of improving it for that specific job. Um, asking it to make sure that the keywords for the job appear the right amount of times in your CV. And then, of course, getting it to write the most perfect cover letter, which anyone who's gone for a job, you know, you spend ages on the CV. And then the cover letter is like, please find attached. Whereas like now you can have the most beautifully written. So then we have a uh, chat GPT for um, doing RFPs. So if anyone is listening and they're familiar with the government e-tender site, OK, and um, there it's basically a way of using the models, using ChatGPT to help you formulate these fantastic answers. So picture this. OK, I don't know. Do you have you ever had to do those government e-tender things? I'm very I'm very familiar with the the uh, e-tendering for government and also quite a number of uh, governments and countries around the world have slightly different variations of it. Yeah. But it's all the same sort of thing. Basically, if you want a tender for business with a, a government organization or a sub a sub government organization or body, uh, you have to go through this tendering process uh, in a lot of countries. So, yeah, I'm very familiar with it. But, yeah, share, share with us some of the, uh, the oh, work so that you're doing. This, there. Picture this. OK, so I'm sure anyone listening has been in this uh, position. You know, you're, you're just completing the tender. It's due tomorrow at 12 midday. You've probably spent about maybe eight or 12 hours working on it to date. And then you get to this question and it's something like outline in detail your sustainability practices in your business. And you're like, oh. so before that would be something that would send me over the edge. I'm not going to fulfill this tender. I've just had it. You know, they're asking everything. I, I kind of throw my toys out of the pram. But now you can just take it over into chat GPT give it some of your basic things about your business and ask it to formulate the response for you. And you can give it the word count and you can say, consider more creative, unusual ideas. Remember the fact that I'm based in a region. So you're going to get this fabulous answer. So in terms of, you know, using ChatGPT to um, create the kind of definitive block answers, and then you can reinvest your time in really crafting the winning answer to the the pieces that you need to work on, like your proposed approach and methodology, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's, so, that's great. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, it's, it's good. So it's basically win the business. And then we were doing a thing on now you've got the business, how to be more efficient in the business. So it's like using AI for things like remote meetings, using AI for presentation, slide deck building. And um, jaws were dropping at that there the other night. Um, using AI for creating a landing page, using AI to make a website in 30 seconds. Um, so I get to have this wonderful position, Simon, where I'm showing and everyone's wowing. Um, and we're all just having this moment of pretty much like there's a lot of joy in the sessions because people are like, this is amazing. And then I'm drilling them on. How are you going to use this? How are you going to use this by next week? So, for example, I had a group last night and then I got them to write down and commit to either using the slide deck one or one of the um, remote meetings ones. It does remote meetings, it does to do lists, it does everything. And then they have to come back and report next week. So it's learning by doing uh, lots of sharing in the session and um, having fun, really. Yeah, I like it a lot. And I think one of the things that's coming through loud and clear is that you know, for people that are engaging with Mary Rose or the AI Institute, regardless of what level or what area you're involved in, maybe is a better way of saying it, or what, what your area of interest or learning is, you seem to have that very layered approach. You can go in at whatever level and yeah. learn, but also the they're tried and tested. They've been road tested, as I said earlier, <laughs> and people have real hands-on way of, of learning the tools, but you've given some great examples there, Mary Rose, of real world applications 
particularly in a business setting where people are going, oh, I can do this with that. Oh, this will help me do that. It will pull together some information that I can then maybe craft a little bit and, and work on a little bit. And to that point, you've mentioned the word prompting a little while. And I know there's lots of column inches and podcasts talk about prompting and the do's and don'ts. But, uh, you know, do you often find yourself asked that question? Because, you know, we often hear that if you ask a better question, you can get a better answer. And in the world of prompting, there seems to be some do's and don'ts. There seems to be the way that you work with the AI tool in question to maybe get it to understand exactly what you're looking for and how much how much work or how many times do you get asked that question? Because I'm sure it must come up a lot. It does come up a lot. <laughs> it does come up a lot. I think, um, sorry, and actually, as you're asking me that question, I was thinking there's another great person who I follow who I love, guy called Ethan Mollick. He's a university professor in Porton, right, in the States. He's brilliant. And he talks a lot around how, you know, prompting is going to disappear. This kind of skill set of prompting is going to disappear. And I can sort of feel that happening already. So we started out at the beginning, let's say, of 2023. And it was all about, uh, you know, there was a lot of these kind of, you know, I call them kind of, you know, it's the tech bros have turned into prompt bros. And they're sharing all these lists on LinkedIn of like, these are the definitive 10 prompts you're ever going to need, you know, this kind of thing. And that made me stop. I was like, I'm not sharing any of my prompts. Not that I don't want to share them. I just don't want to be categorized into that group. Um, Because if you actually do what I do, I'm the person who goes out and tests all their prompts. And I'm like, half of them are not very good at all. But what I do with people is I, I take them through a sequence of you go in and you put something in just generic crap and you get generic crap out. And then I give them a really good base structure for a prompt. And I say, right, now we're on your thing on the same subject. And they're all like, wow, well, so much better. And I'm like, OK, my friends, now some more. And then I get them to do it some more. So that's the kind of prompt structure which you have in your head. OK, the way, the good way to do it. But then you have another type of set of prompts, which are prompts that experts and specialists in a field have created and share with you. So, for example, when it comes to marketing, I'm pretty confident about that. I've created quite a few prompts around things like coming up with the most perfect persona and um, market segmentation, identifying uh, unmet customer needs. When you roll these preset prompts in and then do your prompt. So this is like the third stage of your prompting. The results are just magic. And that's when people are like fist pumping the air and I want to go, I want to do my work now. And I say, no, no, stay to the end. It's a whole two hours and there's a lot more. So my my biggest complaint that I get in the feedback is that um, I share too much information too fast. But my, pro my thing to that is, look, this area, it's moving so fast. I have a lot of things I want to tell you. Um, so what I do is I record all the sessions and then I just urge people to just play it back and put me at a slower pace i hope i'm speaking at the right pace today now Simon. <laughs> yeah, you certainly are and you're Good. right it, it, there's so much information here but what you've shared there is very helpful advice for people uh, that are looking to get the right the right answers or maybe better answers out uh, of these tools and I, I think as well you mentioned the way that it's already changing and we have seen sort of the basic prompting turn into this advanced prompting and people saving prompts but I suppose when the AI outputs start getting fed back into the AI training models, as more and more companies start feeding information into their own models uh, mm -hmm. or into public data models, uh, ChatGPT that you've mentioned upgraded its, its uh, you know, we were stuck at sort of 2021. It now, I think, goes up to at the time of recording, April 23, I think, at this stage. Right. Yeah. Um, at least for G GPT-4, I think I'm right in saying that. But if um, you use it with Bing, you you can actually get it to look at the live internet. Exactly. Yeah, Although then you can pull in stuff. things and plugins yeah. and you can get up to right up to date information. Yeah, it's a great point. But I, I suppose the other thing that you, you mentioned there in terms <laughs> of the, it constantly evolves, and you were talking about text to video, and that is great. And I, I, I have spoken to a number of people who are really working with how to get consistent video frames running through because one of the problems is they're quite short at the moment, as opposed to, say, making a feature film where you want a consistent character running through. That's that's quite challenging still, mm -hmm. although there are people making great um, strides in that. But even voice to AI now, I know with ChatGPT, yeah. you, you can just talk to it now, particularly on the, the mobile version of the app, you and can. just just start having this sort of conversation with it, right? Are you, are you people experimenting yeah. with that at the moment? 
You can, but what we were playing with in another group actually last week, and I'm smiling because we had so much fun. And one of the oldest gentlemen has ever taken my course. He's about 69. He made an avatar of himself and he was just tickled. He was like a small boy laughing through that class because we were playing with tools like um, Hey Jen and Synthesia and Eleven Labs. So they're kind of ones that are based around creating synthetic avatars of yourself. But you can with Hey Jen, you can use one of their synthetic avatars or you can upload yourself and then literally you can save that. And then you have a text box and you can type whatever you want. And then your synthetic self avatar does the talking. So great gas in the class, had a bit of fun. But then we were talking as a group about, OK, what are the different user cases of this? So it was a marketing group. And um, people were coming up with amazing ideas about like one woman was saying, you know, my CEO, you know, he's no problem. You know, he's very good at communicating on video, but he's very hard to get a hold of. So she was saying she's going to make a synthetic avatar of her CEO. And then if some news comes out that she wants him to quickly respond to, she can text it to him. He can approve it and then she can type it into the box. And there you go. Share it on social CEO initial response. And you wouldn't really notice the difference now. You would a little teeny bit on, I find on my one, the accent's a little bit kind of fluctuating between Irish and American. Um, if you're in America, you're going to be fine because all I think that's the main market that the accents are trained on. Um, but it's just, it's so exciting. Like I got a, I got a video testimonial someone did for me and I just uh, went into 11 labs and I translate, I just pressed a button. I translated it into Spanish. And there is this woman with this amazing Dublin accent speaking amazing Spanish accent. And I could push push them out across uh, Spanish social media, <laughs> you know. So just the possibilities are are endless. It's amazing. Yeah, there's an awful lot of those great applications, particularly in, in the podcast world, whether it's video or audio. Yeah. Uh, being able to translate in real time and, you know, push out to new audiences is, is really exciting. Are you using any yourself? Uh, yeah, I, we have used them. I've used them in a commercial setting as opposed to here on the global discussion. Um, but we have used them quite a lot in commercial settings. And I think for um, for podcasters or for people that are trying to reach international audiences with their content, being able to see Mary Rose or Simon speaking fluent French or German or Spanish yeah. or Italian or whatever, uh, I think that really does change the market fundamentals, I think. Exactly. Uh, and from from the tests that I've been running, um they're pretty accurate you know they're pretty mm. good and the the accents and the the mm. lip syncing is is it's it's so you know it's very hard to spot 98 you know? yeah there. yeah and i would agree I, I, i'd in. say 95 98 it's not bad yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, which is pretty which good. is compared to what we could do before it's mind-blowing but uh yeah. it, it's funny as humans we have this little sense we can tell something slightly off don't we we have yes. this sort of extra ability in there this human element it does friend. bring me on to something i want to <laughs> ask you though if i can mary rose because i don't want to run out of time without squeezing these questions in there's a lot going on in your world you're probably you know you're engaged in probably the fastest moving news and technology story on the planet ever right so that's exciting but when you plan yourself when you think about the next six to twelve months the next 18 months what does that look like for you what are you planning what's on your horizon what does the roadmap look like and what are you hoping to achieve thanks so for asking that question um i have a roadmap but it's 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 loose ideas set out because obviously things are changing so fast um my immediate push is i am launching the ai institute as i said um, not going to go on about that too much. So we're going to have a version one minimum viable product that's going to come to market. People can come in, they can browse the courses. That's not unlike anything you've seen before. Or that is like something you've seen before. The next phase will be a more avatar led sense of, um, of the same courses. We'll have done a lot of data analytics to see what resonates well with our audience. And then we can deliver them by avatar when it's at 100%. It's not ready yet. That's why I'll be watching. I'll be watching. And as soon as I see them ready to go, boom. The next phase is another phase, which I suppose I should really keep under wraps because I'm not going to be sharing it to a global audience in case someone else takes it. But it's actually more exciting. It's more really fully utilizing AI so that every learner has their own unique experience so that you come on, for example, 
and you might learn in a certain way and you might come with a certain skill set and knowledge, you will have a different experience to me all on the same platform. So um, maybe ask me back in a couple of months and let me give you an update on uh, where they're at. I'd love to come back. Well, that that sounds exciting, Mary Rose. And that, look, there's, you're going to have a busy 12 months, whatever that whatever happens, that's for sure. Uh, and yeah, really exciting as well in terms of the content creation and the, the avatar aspects of it, because that is getting more and more sophisticated every day I check in on it. And uh, also some of that sort of, almost tailored, bespoke, different experience for me as a learner or for whoever as a learner. That's really important too. And so finally, mm-hmm. um, just a couple of couple of things. Is there anything else that we haven't touched on here today that you'd like to share with our international audience? And secondly, and really importantly, if people want to reach out and connect with you, where's the best place to point people to? I'll answer that one first. So the best place to find me personally is on LinkedIn, Mary Rose Lyons. And the best place to find the AI Institute is online, instituteofaistudies.com. The site is going to be live uh, in December. And I'd love for anyone to come along, give me your feedback and uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. One last thing I would love to mention, and it's very dear to my heart. We kind of touched on it when we were talking about the diversity thing. Um, no matter what size of company you're from and no matter what comp- country you're listening from today, I would urge you to have some thought to crafting your AI policy for your business. So if you go on to uh, my website, Brightspark Consulting, that's the original site, I have an AI policy link as a footer beside my privacy policy. And in my AI policy, I set out the tools that I'm using, because transparency is super important. I use, say, the tools I'm using, um, how they were selected, um, the kind of way I'm using them. And I kind of like heads up, like, you know, this these are being used, but it kind of saves me from the kind of the need to put it out on every newsletter, which I do anyway at the end, like that the, the images were created by this, the editing by me and so on. But it's really important, I think, to do that because um just being a sort of an early adopter, you know, you need to wear the badge of being a mindful early adopter and um, put it on the bottom of your website and they won't judge you badly for it, let's just say. So on my uh, old website, Brightspark, um, you can look up AI policy template and um, you can get a template and you can chop it and change it and do what you like with it. And if, you, if everyone did that after listening to this today, I would be feeling very, very grateful and like a job well done well look that's a that's a great note and some great uh, some great uh, advice there to finish us up on on this episode of the show uh thanks to everybody who's been watching or listening to mary rose and i here on the global discussion uh, make sure that you follow like subscribe do everything that we're doing here on the show uh make sure that you check back in on us for some more discussions with creatives and leaders and thinkers just like mary rose and of course Go and check out everything that's happening at the AI Institute. Uh, Really worth your time. So thank you so much indeed, Mary Rose. It's been wonderful to talk to you again today. And you too. Thanks, Simon. Bye.